Pierce Ferry Road and uh, 15th Street. Starts at 6 o'clock. And then we'll have the regular services wherever. Uh, don't forget, I think, one more day up at uh, uh, Pink, the Pink Church. Uh, they'll still be open for a prayer. This is a time to rejoice. Amen? Uh, tonight, before we go any further, does anybody have a praise for the Lord? God has done something good for you and would like to just say, thank you, Lord. Anyone at all? We're going to have a communion service at, after the service. Uh, I've chosen a subject that I've spoken on many occasions over the years. Perhaps not to the extent that I'm going to tonight, but... Uh, Thank you. Gethsemane, Golgotha, and the glory of the cross. And our scripture is found in the book of uh, Mark, the 15th chapter, the 22nd through the 39th verse. One more time, does anybody have a praise report? I raised my hand. Uh, okay, I, that's my blind side. Uh, go right ahead. Yeah, I just want to say, you know, I've heard several people say today that they were feeling really tired. Some even took naps this afternoon. And, you know, I started to feel like I should go and lay down, and I decided instead that we were, Nicholas and I were going to go for a walk instead. So I got up and I said, I'm not doing this. I got up, got him, and we went for a walk. And I did not lay down and take a nap. So, but I do believe that that was the Lord saying, you need to move. So I did. Amen. I'm glad that he uh, sees where we can move and where we can't move. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to call you, Pastor, but... Um, anybody else tonight? I'm thankful for movement also. Amen. Lord Praise God. the Lord. God is a good God. Amen. This is the time of the year that uh, is the highlight of all Christians everywhere. And they bring him into the place, Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with beer, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments and cast lots upon them, whatever man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of the accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on the right hand and the other on his left. And that the scripture was fulfilled which said that he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, tacking, wagging their heads, saying, Ah, oh, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking among themselves with the scribes, he, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend from the, the cross that we may see him and believe in, that they were crucified with him, reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness of the whole land unto the ninth hour, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them stood by when they heard it and said, Behold, he calls for Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it to, on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come down, come to take him down. Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Father, we ask you to bless your word. 
and help us, oh God, one more time to visit that awful place, that place of death, that place where our salvation springs from, and help us, oh God, to appreciate what you did for us, Jesus. Help us to understand that it was you and you alone that took our place for our sin. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. The remarkable thing, when we look at Jesus and we look at the scenario of the cross, I mentioned this to several people today that uh, the last 25% uh, of all poor Gospels talk about the last two weeks of the life of Jesus. But Golgotha and Calvary are in fact the same place. They're inseparable, and neither can separate. We cannot separate the ugliness of the cross from the glory of the cross. We like to sing about the cross and its glory, but how ugly it was. And for just a couple moments tonight, I would like to just take you back there. Uh, can you hear the sounds can you smell the smells? Because it was crowded. There were people there and they had expected at the beginning of the week something great was going to happen. They had sing with rejoicing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Salvation has come. Jesus said if things didn't cry out, even the very rocks would cry out. We're taking just a little look at what the Bible says about the events surrounding the cross. And again, we all know this, but sometimes we need to be reminded. Three of the four Gospels refer to the place that, where Jesus was crucified in the Hebrew tongue as Golgotha, the place of the skull. Only in one account, and only one occasion in the entirety of the New Testament is the place referred to as Calvary. But we don't sing about Golgotha, do we? We sing about Calvary. Yes. I don't, and I mentioned this to Joshua, I don't remember, recall any churches anywhere that are named the Church of Golgotha. No. Uh, I've been pastoring a church called Calvary Temple for the last 29 years. Uh, we don't sing about Golgotha. Uh, we don't refer to Golgotha very often, but if you saw the news the last week, on several occasions they saw pictures of uh, Jerusalem and that ugly place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. I'm not saying anything is wrong uh, with calling it Golgotha or Calvary, but uh, I sometimes think we need to go back and uh, I use these words to the nitty gritty of what happened there. Calvary and Golgotha are the same place. Uh, they have this, basically the same meaning. But can I say they're, they present two entirely different views, I believe, to a certain extent, of the cross. Golgotha represents the ugliness where Calvary seems to point to the glory of that place. We often talk about the glory, the grace, the victory. but the meaning of its name is still the place of the skull. Right. It seems sometimes like the mountain itself, when you look at it, appears to be the appearance of death. Sometimes visitors appear to it and look at it, the giant skull, and it has a reputation of death. Too often we forget that that was 
part of the culture of that moment and that time. Even the sound of the name seems crude and ugly when it comes from our lips. Golgotha. And when we say Calvary, it sounds much better, doesn't it? But I want to remind you that uh, this is, again, the same place. We cannot separate the ugliness of the cross from the glory of the cross, though. We can't celebrate the grace of the cross from the pain of the cross. And we can't so, uh, separate the victory of the cross from the violence of the cross. That's some words that I didn't make up. I borrowed from somebody else because they said much better than I can. Uh, when we often think about this, um, I'm convinced that we can't really embrace the power of the cross without embracing the ugliness of the cross as well. We need to rediscover that victorious Calvary was first ugly Golgotha. So this evening as I stumbled through my notes, the ugliness of the cross that we try to present also has a beauty that still shines through because death was a finality, but life was also something that we rediscovered that was real. And death was conquered because Jesus Christ arose from the dead. Golgotha. Uh, it's a place of execu execution. It's not a religious ceremony. This was where Jesus was executed. He died as a, a criminal among criminals. We don't like to think that, but that's what he was accused of. And as we go through this this evening, just for a couple moments, uh, let your mind think about this. This was not the only form of execution. They beheaded people and they still do in the Middle East. They still burn people at the stake. But this method of execution was symbolically shameful and excruciating pain was a part of it. It was not just a death, but it was a suffering before death. The Sanhedrin could have asked for any form of death, but they chose the worst imaginable death that was available, the death upon the cross. They understood that the Romans were go along with whatever they said and would even oftentimes speak of the cross, but to the Jews it was merely a death. But it was considered by those to be a place where you had to be cursed. And there was a saying, cursed is he that hangs on a tree. It was viewed the same way we would view it today, with horror. Can you imagine going to a, an execution in today's world with all our refinement and all our sophistication? And we have grown so much in the last 2,000 years, but yet somehow we need to be reminded of how terrible that moment was. It was not a mistake that Jesus was born during this time in this culture. He was born and died when he died, and the cross was the only death that could reflect the wrath of God toward our sin, and our sin is part of it. 
where the punishment was intentional and painful. The executions of our day, unlike those of then, was death. But their chief goal, goal was to cause pain and suffering, to punish even in that moment in which they died. And they knew how to prolong the horror of the death that they had sophisticated without allowing their victims to lapse into unconsciousness. They also knew how not to damage any of the vital organs so that they could torture the body to the greatest extent. The Imperial Tiberius admitted that the preferred crucifixion was crucifixion or because it extended punishment without granting its victims the relief of death itself. Hanging on the cross naked and humiliated, our Lord suffered the most painful death that could be imagined. We don't like to hear that. It's not a popular, it's not a shout message, is it? <laughs> but God help us to understand that uh, if we don't go to Golgotha, then are we missing the great and terrible price that Jesus paid for us? Yeah. Because it was our sin, my sin, yeah. that sent him to Calvary. Yeah. Yes. You know that the scripture says in another place he could have called 10,000 angels. Yeah. He chose not to. We don't like to hear this kind of sermon, but it was pain beyond description, excruciating. I thought this was remarkable. Uh, as a matter of fact, the word we use, excruciating, came from a, a Latin word which means out of the cross. Well, dare anybody to say he doesn't understand my pain. Amen. Jesus understood our pain. He understands your pain tonight. Yes. Amen. He refused any narcotic mixture at any time, and nothing would be allowed to numb the pain because that pain was a part of the penalty, the price that he paid for our salvation. That's right. For our sins, yeah. Amen. The cross was a place of execution. Most of scholars believe that it weighed 200 pounds. There's one place that uh, I think in Second Peter that the cross is called the tree. The person that was charged with taking the cross had to carry his own cross. And you remember how Jesus, after he had been scourged, 40 times less one that he fell beneath, beneath the Lord. He staggered. Some people paint, and you've probably heard this on some of the television channel, the 39 stripes that he bore that talk about all the sicknesses that took place. But he'd also been beaten around the face. They said, uh, if, if you're the Son of God, tell us who he's hit, hit you. I heard one preacher today, I said that he had a broken nose, I don't know, I know in the book of Psalms that it says his face was almost unrecognizable. And from what we've viewed about the crown of thorns, it pierced into his <coughs> brow and into the back of his head. And let me say that on Golgotha's hill, blood was a plenty. And the smell of blood is very peculiar. And there were other people that were being executed, so death was in the air. They put a sign 
upon him. Remember the encounter with the king, but they did not recognize him then. Shortly before that, at the time when he first entered Jerusalem, he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how after we're together together as a hen that the chicks but thou wouldst not, and he wept. I've always thought when I preached about Jesus that he was a man's man. Uh, he had to be able to be uh, pretty strong to stand up to the torture that he was going to, through. But not only was he carrying his own glory in the cross, but we, we know this and we hear it said, he was carrying the sins of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we imagine what sin was it ours, uh, of ours that he was, he took to Calvary? Oh, we don't like to think about that, do we? All of them. Uh, all of them, but I make reference of it because sometimes we need to isolate the things that were so horrible about us that we couldn't even stand it. Anybody remember that? Or have we matured so much as Christians that we are strong and we're perfect? I think not. <laughs> uh, we're all too human, aren't we? But Jesus carried the sins of the world to Calvary or to Gotham. Not only did he bear our pain, but he buried the humiliation of being naked before his, the crowd. And even though we read in the Mark, the people crying out to them, his family was there. I know we don't like to think of it, but yet, death at that time and often this time is a family affair. But can you imagine being crucified in front of your family with nothing to hide your shame, your person, who you are? And as we look at it, uh, it could last for days, but Jesus was only there six hours. And Pilate was surprised when he found that Joseph of Arimathea was asking for the body. I couldn't help but think of, my mind goes a little bit nuts, and I had something that has nothing to do with the sermon, uh, with the message even, but uh, he was supposed to be in the grave three days and three nights and batted it up uh, at the time that he died on the cross and the time that he rose uh, <clears throat> on Sunday morning is in dispute, but possibly 42 hours or more or less one way or another. But as you figure it the way the Jewish people do, it still was three days and three nights. We look at that and we say, well, what does it matter? Because he was fulfilling the law, he was fulfilling the revelation, the prophecy that had been made of him. And once again, if you look back to the book of Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, 700 years before Christ came on the scene at least, that it was prophesied that he would bear our sins, carry our sorrow, suffer for our healing. The cross weighed 200 pounds. The plaque said, the king of the Jews. And again, 1124, 40 lashes, less than one of Second Corinthians. That was standard practice. And even Paul admitted to having been beaten that one time. He stumbled, he staggered, and Sir Simon the Serene helped him bear his cross. Simon's son allowed my name, Rufus, to be in the Bible. That doesn't matter to anybody but me. <laughs> the nails, why would we talk about the nails? There's always conjecture about where the nails were, but uh, 
and the pictures of the cross are not always accurate. And um, I believe because this was the way they did it, that the arms of the Jesus, when they nailed him to the cross, were at a 90 degree angle up over his head, not out like this. Because it wasn't the nails in his hands or his wrist and his feet that killed him. We'll get to that in a couple moments. But think for, for just a moment. He's at the place of where the cross is. Whether it was one piece or one whole cross, we do not know. There are some places where they have just the cross piece and they had the post already in place. Some place, places they have the cross where they spread him out, but more than likely when they threw him down, they, his back was, his naked back was exposed to the rough lumber. The centurion experiencing something that he had never before seen. This man did not fight. I don't believe that Jesus fought these people that were crucifying him. I think he he didn't try to get away. That's right. The large nails were possibly six inches long and much like a railroad spike if you've seen one of those but they were more pointed. His hands were nailed first, one at a time over his head, and then his left foot, and then his right foot was put over that one. They placed these nails where severe nerves would send excruciating pain through his body, causing him perhaps to convulse in pain. He would make it impossible with his hands over him to breathe easily because of his upper body would be subject to have to pull himself up to be able to breathe back and forth. The psalmist said it this way, he said, pour down like water, all my bones are, are out of joint. My heart is like wax melted in the midst of my bowels. Was there a struggle on the cross? Remember this was a place of public execution and there were two criminals, one on the right and one on the left. <coughs> were there. And all of you probably heard of the swoon theory. Many years ago when I first heard, heard of some of the reasons that Jesus didn't die, I thought, is it possible? There's been a number of books that have been written over the centuries that said Jesus really took a narcotic and he just swooned. And they said that he, some of them said that he married Magna, Mary Magdalene, and there is a culture that said that they, some of his kinfolk, the genealogy, can be traced to our present time. <coughs> Vernon J. or J. Vernon McGee, the great uh, spokesman, got a letter from a woman, and she said, Our preacher said that on Easter, Jesus just swooned on the cross and the disciples nursed him back to death, or back to health, excuse me. What do you think? And McGee replied, dear sister, beat your preacher with a leather whip. <laughs> amen. 39 heavy strokes. Yes, amen. Nail him to the cross. Hang him in the sun for six hours run a spear to his heart, embalm him, but put him in an airless tomb for three days and then see what happens. Most of the time they use 36 yards of linen to wrap around his, the bodies of the death 
the people that died. The centurions had crucified hundreds, if not thousands of men upon crosses. They were very familiar, intimately familiar with death. But one of them said, Matthew 27, 54 said, truly this was the Son of God. But they added the extra precaution, not only a piercing beneath the ribs, and perhaps most people believe the water that came out came from his heart. But they also broke the legs, but Jesus was already dead. When your eyes fall on that cross, let it ever remind you, Jesus was here and Jesus suffered and died for you. But Jesus, even when he was on the cross, transformed that place into a pulpit. Yeah. He made it a place of life in the midst of death. We go back to one of those little Look up, he's reading in Adam's fall, we sinned all. But life came to the second Adam, Jesus Christ. He died so that I would never know the sting of death and that the door to eternal life would be open before me and you and everyone that believes on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May I say it is a, a forsaken place, the cross of Golgotha. Have you ever felt alone, forsaken, abandoned by those people around you? Have you ever been in the midst of a crowd and everybody seemed to be know what was going on, but you felt so lonely? You felt like you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. But as we have been talking about the physical struggles that was going on at Golgotha. There was also emotional pain that Christ felt as well. We all fear somebody uh, that we love might abandon us. It's one of those feelings we have in our heart. But you think about it, the way to Golgotha was paid for those who had forsaken our Lord. Those people that cried out less than a week before then, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, the one that they could have had, but they said, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Now, where were they? Even those that were intimately a part of his life, they abandoned him. One of his disciples that had been with him for three and a half years abandoned him for 30 pieces of silver. And you all know that that was 30 pieces of silver was the price of a slave. And he would betray him with a kiss. Another disciple would curse having known of him just to save face for a little waitress, a little girl that said, that's the man that I saw with Jesus. All but one disciple would abandon him and flee but one. Anybody remember who that was? John. John. Those that he had poured his life out for, didn't even know him. The pain that he must have had. Forsaken by the world. I might have mentioned it earlier, but mentioned it again. The Persians were the first ones on earth that figured out how to torture people. 
how the criminals uh, would take sometimes, as we mentioned, days to die. They designed a method so that uh, the victim could see the people around him until they died. They hang literally between heaven and hell while they died. Sometimes as we look back over that time, we, we wonder just exactly how in the world can it uh, be a part of who we are. I think the hardest part, and we often have read it when we go to the seven last words of the cross, when Jesus said, Ilama, Ilama, Salvaktana, and I didn't get all the words properly, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Can you hear that cry from the cross tonight? In his humanity, he suffered as no man had ever suffered before because it wasn't just the physical thing, it was the my opinion and most scholars' opinions, that it was that he became sin and sin must die. Sin had to die the death. And Leviticus the 17th chapter, the 11th verse, said that without blood, sin cannot be forgiven. And Hebrews 9, 22, I believe it is, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. As far as we know, this perhaps was the only time that Jesus ever said to the Father, why? I wonder how many times a day I say why. Yeah. We know the answer. He felt forsaken for that moment so that we'd be forever accepted by the Father. Aren't you glad you're accepted by the Father? Amen. The Bible says we're accepted in the beloved tonight. That cross is truly a bridge between heaven and hell. I know that you've seen pictures of it, and I'm always delighted when I see something like that, a place where multitudes can cross over. Paul the Apostle, on a couple of occasions, one specifically, he says, I would know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and the cross and Jesus crucified. But this momentary separation from God brings us to the closing moments of our message and the closing of that moment there. We often say, I'd never forsake him just like Peter did. But sometimes in our life's choices and the way that we live, we almost forget that Jesus is a part of our life. I believe that he was a man among men to be able to endure Golgotha. This is one of my scriptures that I love to uh, close with, 1 Corinthians 1.18. The preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who believe it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. I often think about Another place where Paul said, if the princes of this world knew that the cross would do what it did on Calvary, they would not have crucified him. Yeah. But God used the most horrible thing that man could do to punish and suffer him. And that's what he did for us. He took our punishment. He, he endured our death. And because we believe we might be hurt of the second death. Golgotha, the place of the skull. I mentioned this to my wife uh, 50 years ago. I preached Good Friday service up at Mount Tipton School. I was, we were the only church here at that time. And I said, take a, a little walk with me from Pilate's 
place to Golgotha's hill. They had ripped away the scarlet gown and he began to drag it through the cobblestone stone streets of Jerusalem. Can you hear? And you can hear that some of the women, women crying and you can hear some of the people that wanted Barabbas jeering at him. And he staggered and it fell. One terrible day. A Roman of aristocratic, aristocratic means a very rich man said hundreds of miles away wrote in his journal somewhere a God has died this day and as we read in the scripture the veil was ripped in two because Jesus made a way from having to stand out and go through somebody else to have your sins forgiven, have them crucified, or to kill a little lamb or an ox or a dove for your sins. But now we can go into the very presence, the Holy of Holies, and the writer of Hebrews says, come boldly to now to the throne of grace that you may obtain help in time of need. Aren't you glad that you could have that help in time of need tonight? And he went to the cross, And he died. That's the end of the story. <laughs> Aren't you glad it's not the end of the story? Amen. But we'll tell the rest of the story Sunday morning in sunrise service. We're going to turn our service over now to uh, Joshua. But God help us to appreciate what Jesus did for us upon Golgotha's hill. passing that out, you know, oftentimes when I think about the cross and the price that Jesus paid, you know, I think about the crown of thorns, as Pastor Ruby was talking about, you know, when man fell in sin, God said, curse be the ground, and thorns and thistles grew. Thorns represent the curse. Amen. And Jesus took the curse upon himself. And in Zechariah, the Bible says that a fountain would be opened for, for to cleanse sins. And when his side was pierced and the blood and the water went forth, there was a fountain open. And I was thinking as Pastor Rudy was preaching that sometimes you need to hear a bloody gospel because it's the blood of Jesus that washes us white as snow. It's the blood that, as Andre Krause said, reaches to the highest mountain and flows to the lowest valley. It, it's the blood of Jesus that there is power. Power, wonder-working power. And the precious blood of the Lamb. And as followers of Christ, Jesus told us, take up your cross and follow me. 
You know, religion is hanging around the cross. Amen. True Christianity is getting on the cross. Amen. Is laying down your life to follow Jesus. I'm going to read out of Mark's Gospel, 14th chapter, uh, verse 22. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and break it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Father, we thank you right now, even for the price that was paid. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for every stripe that was upon your back, by taking up the crown of thorns, taking the curse, taking pain it all. We come before you and we do it in obedience and remembrance for the price that you paid for us. Let's break and eat. Verse 23, and he took the cup and we, when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said unto them, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Lord, we thank you for the blood that was shed, that we can boldly come before the throne of grace. We thank you that we have been washed white as snow. We thank you that on the cross you said it is finished, paid in full. God, we're grateful tonight for the price that was paid. And we thank you for the resurrection life that we now have in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Want me to close in prayer or could we sing that chorus? When I see the blood. 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 I will pass. I will pass over you. I don't know the song. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, I'm going to close in prayer, but if there's anybody here tonight that needs prayer for anything, the altars will be open. Uh, we'll pray for you. Believe God for whatever miracle you may need. Or, you know, in this season, let me know that God is a giver. This Amen. whole season is Amen. for God so loved that he gave. Yes. God is a giver. If there's something that we need to receive from God, He's here tonight. So, Father, we thank you for for the message that Pastor Rudy gave us. We thank you for your word. Your word is true. Lord, we just lift up uh, just every family here. And God, we just say we're grateful for all that you do in our lives and for the price that you pay. And Lord, I just pray if there there's any here that may need something from you, I pray, God, that they would not leave without being receptive to receive that you are the God who is a very present help in a time of need. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. If there's any turkey left over, please take it home. I don't have room for it.